when I was a child, I was obsessed with two things, horses and mythology. Horses have always seemed magical. They're beautiful, they're graceful, they're powerful, and they partner with humans in ways no other animal does. The myths I love the most were inspired by horses, and my favorite was the hippogriff. Have horse and have griffin, or in the world of Harry Potter, have eagle. They are fierce, powerful creatures with shimmering coats and big talons. They are also beautiful and graceful and dangerous, deadly even. According to mythology, they are intensely proud creatures and they demand respect. And you do this by bowing before you approach them and seeing if they bow in return. If he doesn't, you've offended him in some way and you are going to get hurt. But if he does bow to you, he will be loyal and protective of you. You've earned his trust, been accepted as part of his herd. Isn't that what a lot of us want? To be part of a herd? To belong? When I was a girl, my sister and I spent as much time as we could with horses. And we learned a lot about responsibility, trust, communication, when to move quickly and when to slow down, how to keep each other safe, and how to find joy in being together. And as an adult, I am still obsessed with horses, and I've come to understand that they are not just magical creatures. They are gifted teachers with insights for us as humans. They have a lot to teach us about what it means to live in community, what it means to be truly and authentically ourselves, what it takes to be a leader, and what we should expect from our leaders. Here are a few of the insights that have helped horses not just survive, but to create healthy and sustainable communities for thousands of years. First, they know a fundamental truth that we humans do not, and that is that we are safer together than we are apart. When horses are in danger, they come close together. They put their vulnerable in the middle. They surround them. They protect them. We humans tend to do the opposite. We spread out, we scatter, we take out off on our own. Isn't that what always happens in horror movies? Everybody runs in different directions to get away from the killer, and they all end up dead. <laughs> How much safer would they be if they stayed together, fought together, and protected each other? Horses also know that leadership is shared. They live in what June Gunter of Teaching Horse describes as the diamond model of shared leadership. This is an ancient and highly effective framework for understanding what it takes to get safely and successfully through the unknown together. It's based on herd behavior, and it understands and recognizes the leadership happens from the front, the middle, and behind the herd. And it identifies four key leadership capabilities that are necessary. Attention. What needs our attention? What do we notice about ourselves, others, and our environment? Direction. Choosing a direction by having a focus and a vision, knowing where we're going, and understanding when and how we need to course correct. Energy. Setting a pace that matches reality without under or overreacting to changes in the environment. And congruence. Aligning our inner and outer expressions so we show up as we truly are and we can be trusted. All four of these capabilities are essential for a leader to be worth following. How much stronger could our leaders be if we spent time and energy in developing these capabilities, particularly in our youth, our next generation of leaders? Horses live and lead without judgment. They don't care what your title is, how much money you make, or how big your house is. <laughs> they live outside. <laughs> They care, <laughs> they care how you show up with the capabilities. And with horses, it's not about hierarchy and rank because they know it's about roles that share leadership. And it's not about seniority, although they do know that wisdom comes with age and experience. And they don't hold on to past behavior. When problems arise in a herd, they deal with it immediately with hooves and teeth and sometimes really loudly, but then it's over and they move on together, and they do not carry the baggage with them. What could our relationship look like? How much healthier could they be if we did not hold on to past hurt? 
How much more effective could our organizations be if we didn't show up to meetings with preconceived notions and judgment because we know it's going to happen. It always does. What if we expected others to show up with our collective best interest at heart? Horses also live diversity, equity, and inclusion. They don't care where you came from or who your people are. They don't even care how big you are. Sometimes it's the little guys that have mastered the capabilities that step into those leadership roles, and the big horses follow them. With horses, leadership is not gender dependent. Males and females can serve in any of the roles. They're constantly collaborating and working together to move the herd forward. Who would leaders be if we chose them, not based on what they look like, where they came from, or what their political party is? What if we based our, our choice of leaders on their strengths? Finally, and perhaps most importantly, horses know leaders need to rest. When equine leaders are tired, and they do get tired, they have to move pretty quickly sometimes, they come to the center of the herd where they are surrounded and protected, and other members step up into those leadership roles so that they can lie down and sleep. That whole thing about horses only sleeping standing up is totally not true. There is so much to learn from horses. And this is why I facilitate educational opportunities for people with horses. Through activities, observation, and discussion, we get to experience this for ourselves. And we do it with middle schools all the way up to C-suite executives and entire organizations. This work is so effective because when we're with the horses, they treat us like another horse. They hold us to the same expectations that they have of their herd members. It's really quite powerful because, you see, their feedback is immediate and has no judgment attached to it at all. They respond to what we think, what we feel, and what we do. If I change my behavior, the horse will change hers. This lets me see how my leadership behavior impacts the horses, positively or negatively. And then I can take that and I can change how I interact with humans. And it works. We learn what needs our attention and what does not. How to set healthy boundaries. How to create effective teams that get us where we want to be. And we learn how to trust ourselves. And this is so beautiful because when we trust ourselves, it inspires others to trust us. These are the lessons that I've spent the last five years learning, living, and now helping horses to teach. Last summer, I had the opportunity to go to Return to Freedom, which is a wild horse sanctuary out in California. I went with several colleagues to see these behaviors in the wild for ourselves. And while I was there, I had an encounter that's really difficult to put into words, but I'm going to try. On the last day, we went to see the stallions. Now, these are males that lived with their families wild and free. They have never been domesticated. But eventually, they were rounded up on the range, and they were brought to return to freedom to live out their days together. We entered a very large field with eight of these magnificent beasts. <laughs> and as we got to the middle of the, the field, one of them started walking very purposefully toward me. He was a giant. He had legs like tree trunks and feet like dinner plates, and his head was the size of a tire. And it was covered with bumps and gnarls and scars from past battles. And as he approached me, somebody behind me said, he looks like a dragon. <laughs> and he did. He was iridescent, and he shimmered gold. He took my breath away, quite literally because we were nose to nose, greeting each other by exchanging breath, as horses do. That is how they do it. And as I stood there with his face and my face, I was really aware he could hurt me with a strike of his hoof or a swing of that ginormous head. Instead, what I felt was awe and gratitude and a little bit of disbelief that this was actually happening to me. We stayed like this just being present with each other for quite a while. 
And eventually he lowered his head and he ambled away. And in that moment, I knew that I had just met a real live hippogriff. <laughs> and we had bowed to each other. I felt safe. I felt trusted. I felt accepted by him. My attention, direction, and energy were aligned with his. I was truly myself, fully congruent, and he knew it. This was one of the most profound experiences in my entire life. And I am so grateful for all of the people and the opportunities and the horses that have allowed me to grow and brought me to this time and this place to share this truth with you. Post-COVID, we live in an increasingly fractured society. The concepts of collective attention, collective direction, collective energy, and collective congruence provide a lens for us to come together and choose the leaders we need to address our shared concerns. Quality education, access to healthcare, social services that work, and keeping all of us safe. I dare us to envision a community where we live more like horses, grounded in the capabilities of attention, direction, energy, and congruence sharing leadership, protecting our vulnerable, resting when we need to, and trusting each other to get through these uncertain times together. We can build healthy and sustainable communities for us. On that gorgeous hippogriff, they call him Elvis. How cool is that? <laughs> Thank you.